Hello there. Welcome back to Star Wars in a Galaxy, watching all the Star Wars we can get our hands on. This is episode number 123. I'm Jacob. I'm Eli. And today we are going to be continuing our chronological rewatch through all of Star Wars. As usual, we are taking a look at part four of the Obi-Wan Kenobi show. Very good episode. We're back. There's a lot we to are dive back. into. We are back. We've been away for a little while. I was uh, I was out of town. We're back. We're getting back on track. We're, we're um, getting back to Obi Wan Kenobi. Eli, do you want to do you want to recap the episode for us? Real Absolutely. Fast? So after Obi defeat on the planet of Mapuzo, Tala gets him off world and gets him specifically to the path base on the planet of Jabim. There, Obi Wan meets a local leader of the path. His name is Colin Broken. And they immediately try to discuss getting uh, Leia back from for from Fortress Inquisitorius. Something that everybody dismisses other than Tala and Kenobi at first. Because the idea of breaking into Fortress Inquisitorius is something that's never been done before. Wink, wink. <laughs> cough, cough, Cal Kestis. <laughs> it's fun. Again, it's so funny to me that Survivor takes place near this. Because it's like, it's never happened before. <laughs> no one's ever gotten yeah. out of there all anyway we'll get to that meanwhile reva interrogates leia in the in an imperial holding cell with two very little success we see leia's fiery spirit is already there at the age of nine years old but finally kenobi convinces broken to send him tala and then two of their best pilots sully stark and wade Verzelian to go and infiltrate the Fortress Inquisitorius to try and get Leia back. The Obi-Wan ends up having to swim into the fortress through the oceans of Nur, while Tala dis- Never seen that before. <laughs> yeah. While Tala disguises herself as an Imperial officer and disrupts various Imperial operations at key moments to make sure Obi-Wan rescues Leia. Reva finally has enough of Leia, and so she- takes her to an imperial torture chamber. Yeah, she's going to torture a fucking nine-year-old. That's definitely a war crime. But And Obi-Wan ventures further into Fortress Inquisitorius, where he sees a makeshift morgue, where the bodies of deceased Jedi like Coleman Cage and Terra Sinube are displayed in a petrified state that they were when they died, in, even including a deceased youngling. Meanwhile, Tala manages to distract Reva by providing her evidence that the path is based out of Florum in the Sirtar Sector, which is a fun little reference there. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan infiltrates um, the Imperial's defenses, gets into the prison cell, rescues Leia, and man manages to escape with her. There's a se sequence in this tunnel where Obi-Wan has to control because a piece of glass gets shattered. And he has to stop the water from flowing in from Nur's oceans. And he strategically floods a tunnel and kills probably about 10, 15 stormtroopers. Juan and Tala manage to get, to escape with Leia with Obi-Wan hiding Leia under his an Imperial trench coat. We're going to get to that. Don't make me go absolute ape shit on that scene. Don't make me go absolute ape shit defending this scene. Like, <laughs> I... I do not want to have to defend. The discourse around this scene was so maddening when it came out. I'm so irritated by it. But anyway, the path manages to wait and Sully manages manage to distract Reva as she figures out what's going on. Unfortunately, Wade dies in the... Wade dies distracting Leia. Uh, so, uh, Wade dies distracting Reva from the, from the escape party. And in the in the land in the snow speeder in the land speeder actually, air speeder, that's what it is. In the air speeder, they regroup with a ship with Roken, and they're just glad to get Leia back safe. Darth Vader storms Fortress Inquisitorius, furious with Reva for losing Kenobi, until she she tells them that she installed a tracker onto their ship, and Vader clearly. Is, just decides not to kill her, but is still keeping her at an arm's at arm's length and on a short leash. And as Leia and Obi Wan rejoice about getting her out alive and unscathed, 
we see that Lola, Leia's droid, contains the tracker that Le- that Reva was talking about, leaving us to the next episode. Quite an eventful episode. There's some there there's some really great there's some really great stuff in this episode. Where do you want to start with this? I want to start with the opening scene. Um, Actually, wait before you start. Because... Sorry, before you start with the opening scene, I just got to mention because okay. I wouldn't be doing this season justice if I didn't mention this. I need to keep up the bit. That intro, though, I will. I'm going to mention in every single episode the intro of the sand like going into the Obi-Wan Kenobi logo and the eye being the lightsaber. I'm going to mention that every episode without fail. It's a pretty aw- it's pretty I, it's awesome. so cool that I, awesome. I I think I'm on a four no, episode streak now no and I'm yet. going to I'm going to keep it up till episode six. Yeah. It's amazing. So Obi Wan awakens on Jabim and I think I, this scene is amazing. I think they do such a good job in this show. One of the things that they really do well is they when they do decide to do it, and I don't think they focus in on it enough, but when the show does decide to do it, it really gets the, the, the tension between Obi-Wan and Vader, the emotional intensity, of everything that we've seen, that we've read, that we've watched, building up to these little moments where they cut back and forth in the back to tank, especially now that Kenobi has sustained a little bit of what uh, Anakin or Vader has gone through. It's, the parallels couldn't be clearer. But Kenobi heals yeah. in this episode. And I think Tala even says, your injuries aren't even the only, aren't the only thing that needs to heal. They're making it very clear that this is about more, obviously, than the physical. Metaphorically, I think it's a great descriptor of who these two men are and how they respond to the defining events in their lives. With And I'm not saying it's entirely Anakin's fault, because he was manipulated and there was a lot going on. But I thought it was very cool, nonetheless, how they put that into the story in a symbolic way as well, guide guide the viewer. So I thought it was a really great opening scene, very dramatic. I was There's a big some fan really of great opener, you know? editing, both cin- both like cinematography wise and also like sound editing wise. Again, I don't need yeah. to compliment the. I don't even feel actually. I feel I do actually. I feel like the sound editors, David W. Collins, Matthew Wood. All those people who work under them are constantly the unsung, unsung heroes of Star Wars. They constantly hit it out of the park with stuff, but especially here when we have all these like flashbacks and echoes of the past, I think they're just really well done. And I agree with you, like with Obi Wan having to heal. This episode is a lot about healing. Obi Wan healing from that, from the mental and physical stars of last episode, and. No, it's just, it, like, there, this is the episode, I feel like, where this man starts the episode as Ben. And he ends the episode as Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're absolutely right. This episode is the turning point for him. This is the tipping point. No pun intended. This is the fulcrum. No pun intended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm having too yeah, much Yeah, I know, fun. you are. First, I think the first scene with Roken is super key to this episode. Yeah. And I think if we need to m- put it on one moment when we say, okay, this is the tipping point, he wakes up, where's Leia? First well, I would off, actually go a little out. later, actually. I would go, really, I feel like the minute he enters Fortress Inquisitorious in this episode, that's when I feel Obi-Wan's back. Yeah. It's throughout this episode, I think you can argue that it's in multiple places. And it, maybe it doesn't happen all yeah. at once, but I think Absolutely. he steps out in a much more Jedi-like outfit. It's literally... It's not only it's sharper, it's more defined. Yeah. It and looks a lot more course. like the Jedi robes. Of yeah, a- he's been burned, like badly burned, second degree, maybe third degree burns. And his immediate first thought is, okay, where's Leia? What the hell happened to her? Yeah. Yeah, and he's absolutely determined to rescue Leia. When he comes out of the back of tank on Jabim, he's talking to Roken and Tala. There's no hemming or hawing or hesitation like there was with Bale. He is the one convincing Roken that Leia needs the path to help yeah. her. That rescuing Leia is critical to keeping the path safe. He is that one now. Because before, he... The fear of failure was so big for him. Like, the fear... I'm not the same man I was, Bale. Him going, okay, what if I'm not this person anymore? I don't think I'm Obi-Wan anymore, physically, 
mentally, emotionally, in terms of my connection with the force. That's what he's thinking. But now that that, ba- that bandaid has been completely ripped off in the most horrifying way, the one thing he was trying to do, protect Leia, now Leia's gone. She's taken. So n- now all there is for him, and we see this, is the reality of what he's trying to do. Like, he's completely back in Obi-Wan. He's completely back in General Kenobi mode. Obi-Wan Kenobi mode. You know, yeah. do or do not, there is no try. All he's thinking about is, he even says, I'll go alone. He tells Roken, I'll go alone if I have to. Like, yeah, that, he Obi-Wan doesn't, Kenobi he is doesn't give a fuck because he has, knows what he has to do. And it's, it was, I was like, oh my gosh, man, this is, he's, he's back. back. And, and he's, I, he's I really amazing. do think that, I know there were some people complaining about in the beginning, which I think is an incredibly disingenuous claim, honestly, about Obi-Wan, how defeated and not himself he was. That's the whole point. We needed that Obi-Wan so we could get to this Obi-Wan. Very similar argument I'd make about Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi. Very similar argument that I'd make about even Rex at the beginning of Rebels. We need these characters to be at their lowest points so that the highest points, when they get back up to who they were, feels all the more powerful. That's how this works. And it feels so rewarding now, especially in, in, in 4 to see him deflecting blaster bolts against stormtroopers, to see him like in in that hallway scene with the water and stuff like that, that feels like classic Obi Wan Kenobi, and it fe- and it feels so much better because we saw his ass get whooped by Vader last episode. Like that wasn't a fight. That was Vader kind of toying with Obi Wan, like. Obi-Wan wasn't at the mental capacity to take down Vader, and he knew it. And he knew it. So, it's, to see Obi-Wan back in his element in this episode is just one of the most rewarding things for me to see, and absolutely your points, absolutely. Speaking of Roken, let's get to Roken. I think O.C.A. Jackson Jr. actually does a very good job of Roken. And I remember I was hoping to see Roken in Andor, and that did not work out. But nevertheless, I do hope to see more of Roken because he is a great focal point if we ever need, if we ever want to, which I definitely do want to, venture more into the hidden path. He seems to know what's up. I wonder, I was just thinking about this now, which is that, so, now I'm just thinking, because we now know, because we now know, thanks to Survivor, which we'll get to in a few seasons of In a Galaxy, that Seer is a part of the hidden path. Yeah, and I'm just imagining the scene that where, where Roken and then like where Roken is telling Seer, okay, and then they broke into Fortress Inquisitorius. It was something no one ever had done, and Seer just looks at him like, "Bitch, I did it. <laughs> I fucking did yeah. it." Look, I know a lot of, I know that in some people's brains, this could be like an igno- ignoring a uh, fallen order, but they'd have no way of knowing what Cal and Seer did. It's, it wasn't like that was great, like grand news, like all across the galaxy that the Empire w- would allow to be like trumpeted around the galaxy. That two former Jedi broke in to the very depths of Fortress Inquisitorius for a box. Oh, they're keeping that under wraps. Yeah. <laughs> they're not. Uh, yeah. But, um, yeah, and it's just also setting up stakes to make it, this task seem impossible, which, again, at many points it almost goes wrong. At many points it almost goes wrong. What was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Speaking of Broken Alt as well, there's that line from him that's just, like, great, like, little monologue, only a few sentences long, and I think pr- provides, yeah. like, just a great amount of backstory for him, which is just this, I had a wife once. I knew exactly what she was before I married her. We yeah. tried to hide it, but the Inquisitors found her anyway. So I know exactly what the Empire can do. And that's actually one of the things I like. I love most about Obi Wan Kenobi. Actually, not one of the things I lo- love the most because there are like several pages of things I could write about what I love most about this show. Mm-hmm. But this is an element of like how it blends the political and mystical, because. These these force sensitives. Of course, everybody can use the force, and 
all that kind of stuff, but, like, these people who can reach out and touch the Force like others can't are a persecuted group of people under fascism. That's what's happening here. They are the scapegoat for this fascist government. And it's on, it's about something that they can't control, like all persecuted groups under fascism, whether it was like the Jews under Hitler or what have you. It's again, it's about something that they cannot control. And yet they are persecuted because they, because a scapegoat is needed to blame all of the problems that the galaxy has, that the system has in more broad terms. And it is, this is a, this is a fascist government, but it's also a dark side government. Like whether or not people know it, and I think they keep, the Empire keeps it under wraps actually pretty well, exactly who, oh, yeah, 100%. who the Emperor and Vader are, the ideology is that of the dark side. Whether everyone knows it or not, even probably a lot of stormtroopers and low-level Imperial officers have no fucking idea that's the case. But it's still true. Yeah, the Force is like a myth to most of them. Yeah. That's how the Empire, that's how the Empire wants it. Yeah, the, because of their control of information and all that kind of stuff. And I think Obi-Wan Kenobi does the best job of balancing the political stuff with the mystical stuff. With the still maintaining the Jedi Sith stuff. With all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Do you have anything else to to say before they get on the air speeder? No, I think with the little the scene with Roken again, it he has a very quick about face. So he, I think it's cool how we see him convince he convinces himself that it's the right thing to do, and we see him go through that very quickly with his own sense of empathy and understanding what had happened to his wife was what was happening to Leia and what could happen again and again if he didn't choose to step up and help them out. So I thought that was neat. At first I was like, what that it took him to it took him like thirty seconds to go from no way I'm not helping you to okay I got you, I'm helping you. But it it makes sense. Yeah, I've it, seen it some so I, Yeah, I've like seen that. some criticism about that, but like really Roken gets it. Ro- Roken, that was just his fear holding him back in, in a little bit, and I get it, because no one's ever broken into Fortress Inquisitorius except for that one time you don't know about. So, yeah. but that's, that I feel like is the ethos of Star Wars, is this shit is impossible, nobody's ever done it, okay, let's go do it. <laughs> let's go to... Also, just the just one more thing, actually, before we go for any further. Hearing Fortress Inquisitorius spoken in live-action Star Wars is a fever dream moment. Yeah, no, that was trippy. I was like, oh, wow, they went there. It's so crazy to I'm hear like, that. It is like 70% of the people watching this don't. Oh, know, I'm sure it's more than that. You know? I'm, and if for like a few 10% people, of the people, it was like, oh. If for 10%, it's, oh, you don't say. <laughs> I've seen this before. How interesting. I wonder how this is going to. It's. It, it, that was and, nice. I like and the Fortress Inquisitorius looks so damn good in live action. I will say that I, does, a, yeah. I, I understand that I am very bad. This is a weak spot of mine, and I know this, at detecting the presence of the volume. And when they were getting away with the snow speeders, I could see it a little bit. Looking back on it, I could see it a little bit. And But I've never been good at detecting it. But it, at least my point is that I just really even, like, the sets they did build and, like, the stuff they did do with Fortune Inquisitorious and all the rooms and torture chambers, like, it all just looked really good. It all looked faithful to what the game had done, to what Fallen Order had done, to what the comics had done. The only thing that was really different was the Purge Troopers, which you could easily just chalk up to a new design that hasn't spread around the galaxy yet. And I'm actually, I actually think the new Purge Trooper design is cool, but that's just me. The fact that they even had purge troopers is a testament to how much this show cared. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, it was really cool. It was really cool to see. So getting to the fortress, the Inquisitorious, Tala bluffs her way past security. Shout out to Tala, awesome character. And I thought this, I like this moment a lot, and I want to draw a little bit of attention to it because it shows the Empire's biggest weakness this is something that Andor explores a lot. We get some of it here as well, which is 
when the fear of your superiors is so strong, you know, we get this all over. This is a common theme whenever we see the Empire. When the fear of your superiors is that all-encompassing, that even the slightest hiccup, you're worried that if you're in the wrong or if you're found to have obstructed something, like you, you think that you might get tortured or die or you're toast for in whatever way, people will always choose to cover their own butts rather than act for the good of the collective. And that's exactly what Tala knows. And she exploits that to get in yes. by telling the chief security I, officer, Hey, look, I'm going to get your, I'm going to get your boss to. I thought you were going to go a completely different, a new one different direction with that with Andor actually, which is that like, how did Tala sneak in there? She walked in just like she belonged. She did. That, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly. That's one of the things I admire about Tala in this is that we've seen so many times people try to fake their identities in Star Wars unsuccessfully. This is one of the first times that it actually goes... <laughs> like, this is one of the first times yeah, I can, I can. where this is not a Han in A New Hope. We're fine. Everything's fine here. How are you? This is not that. This is... Tala knows exactly what she's doing. She's been training for this moment. Clearly. And I, I think it's I think it's extremely well done, and I like seeing her be like pull no punches and create these like bogus explanations out of thin air, but that still sound convincing. Yeah, yes, that's what she does. Uh, what she I want to jump back a little bit because I want to go to Reba and Leia's scenes together, which I think are so good. Oh yeah, I think Vivian and Moses's chemistry in this episode is actually a very underrated part of this episode. Yeah, these are some of the best, some of the best parts they're, of this episode. Oh, they're sure. both just acting their hearts out, and Moses is obviously doing a fantastic job, and she provides again. I, I'm going to say this later. She provides the best light side, dark side conflict in a character of the Disney era. I'm sorry, Ben. I said it. That's a big take. That... But I love Ben Solo. I love Kylo Ren. I love his arc in the sequel trilogy. But I just, Reva is just, like, Moses just does such a great job with Reva's stuff. But, and then there's Vivian, who's giving her the exact same amount of professionalism. And she got into the mind of her character. And she's nine fucking years old. The ways that girl can inhabit Leia Organa is unbelievable to me. Yeah, she really makes the role it, her it's, own. It's, she, she does a tremendous it's, job. Just... It's it's so ridiculous how good it is. I want to talk about a reference that I never, ever thought would ever be in an episode of Obi-Wan Kenobi, and it was, and I think they did, I feel like they did this just for me. This is so fantastic. I love this All so right, much. That? Did you catch where, the, where the, the first evidence of the Hidden Path was discovered by the Empire? I did not. Uh, it was what on was the planet it? of Balnab. Now that does sound familiar. It, I it can't should sound, it exactly. It, but... it should sound familiar because we saw Balnab in Star Wars: The Clone Wars, actually. Yes. Really? That I, not where I thought. Okay. Yeah, in maybe one of the greatest episodes of Star Wars: The Clone Wars ever. Oh hell no, Jacob! I have a bad feeling about it's this. It's Nomad Droids, baby. <laughs> Fuck you. I'm, I'm, completely Fuck. Serious. I'm completely serious. I'm completely serious. Okay, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy I'm for you. That's serious. an amazing reference. I'm 100% serious. They got a Nomad Droids reference in this fucking show. Okay. That episode gets on my fucking nerves. Okay. So let's... Well, hats off to the writers, because that's a that's an amazing... That's an amazing so, so callback, me, and I'm happy so for you, So let me explain Eli. something. I'm very happy so let me for explain you. something. The penguin meme. You know God, the penguin that's amazing. meme? The penguin. I don't know what you're talking about. No, now. it's not a penguin. It's not a I'm penguin. Sorry, it's a cat. Again. It's a cat. Never mind. The cat standing in the snow. Maybe. The fuck they doing over? I'm not sure. Oh, keep in mind that Balnab is the planet with LB Dewa and his droid empire. That R two D two and C three PO crumbled in the Clone Wars, and we don't know anything that happened on Balnab since then, but. I guess the, the 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 rebels used it. The path used it as a base for some amount of time, but they probably deserted enough to where probably like the empire didn't find any of them, but probably just found traces of their stuff. Maybe they didn't clean up, but the, but they probably didn't want to touch the fallen droid empire. 
So I'm just imagining the Empire going onto Balnab and doing the and, and seeing the ruins of LBT was destroyed droid empire and going and doing what the fuck they doing over there meme. <laughs> what the hell's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> Which caused me so much joy I cannot explain this to you. Again, the nichest possible reference, but literally I remember watching the episode and I like pausing, googling it to make sure I wasn't dreaming. <laughs> Belnab is referenced in this. Spectacular. LVDY, LVDY is an integral part to Obi Wan Kenobi. It turns out. <laughs> Spectacular. <laughs> Star Wars on Trims matters, but but yeah, we get. But yeah, Obi Wan swims his way up to into Fortress Inquisitorius, which I will say there. There's I know that we both I think. I heard it from you a little earlier, and I have a similar tiny critique of this episode, which is that there are a few beats that feel a bit recycled from Jedi Fallen Order. And I understand it, yeah, I and I understand because probably Fallen Order and Kenobi were in production around the same time. We don't really know production schedules, but I think live-action shows probably take longer than video games. I have but, no idea. I yeah, but anyway, but it's one of those things where it bothers me only the slightest bit. Most people haven't played Fallen Order who are watching this show, so they would never know. For them, it, Obi-Wan's doing this for the first time, and that's fine. That is completely fine. For what it's worth, I think it is a cool touch that at least for the people who have seen this before, they say, hey, Cal may have gotten in all on his own. Clearly, they upgraded the security after after that incident. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And now... <laughs> And now, Obi Wan needs someone on the inside. Oh yeah, absolutely. To actually get inside. Oh, one hundred percent. And like, again, don't get me wrong. That he doesn't completely steal everything from Jedi Fallen Order. Not even close. I'm mostly fine with it. I would say I'm like ninety to ninety five percent fine with it. There are a few things, but that's the other thing I love about Vivian and Moses and the Riven Leia scene. Is that now we see like Vader is probably on Mustafar now. It's a reasonable assumption to make that Le- that Vader's on Mustafar right now. Mustafar is a yeah. is a literal stone's throw away from Nur. So Vader is some of the closest he's ever been to either of his two children, and he has no idea. Reva is so close to figuring out who exactly that girl is, and she has no clue. It's a great moment, yeah. Again, if one or two things happen differently, we would be talking about a very different Skywalker saga. Absolutely. Absolutely, we would. And those kind of moments are why I think of this as the episode 3.5 of Star Wars, really. And yeah. That's why I love the show so much, because it does that so well. <laughs> with Obi-Wan speaking, with Obi-Wan sneaking into Fortress Inquisitorius, I'll just do one, I'll just say one more thing, and I'll, then I'll hand it over back to you, which is that this is a, this is something, this is like a, this is an H that's been scratched repeatedly over and over again in, in modern Star Wars, and I love it. First Rogue One did it, then Solo did it a little bit, but not much. Obviously Obi-Wan did it, and or did it, and friggin' Mandalorian did it a little bit as well. Which is, God, do I love to see modern crafted Imperial Stormtrooper armor. It yeah. just, it makes it feel so, like, nothing against the, the armor that was made for the original trilogy. It looks great, don't get me wrong. But there's just something about seeing that sleek design updated that's just so visceral to me. Like, it makes it, makes it feel all the more dangerous. Like, seeing the original trilogy aesthetic with a modern tone is something that I actually really do love about Rogue One. Despite how much I bash on it, I really do that part of it. And I do like how much... I know there have been a lot of complaints from a lot of people that they've stuck to, that Disney stuck too much to the OT era. But I think one of the advantages of that is that they've gotten to modernize the OT aesthetic. And that we can say now, like... We are, remember when we were talking about War Mantle, Bad Batch, about the transition from Republic to Empire? 
Yeah, hundred percent. We could have said this in Fallen Order or two as well, of course, but there's no mistaking it. We are in the time of the fucking empire now. <laughs> yeah, hundred. There's no denying it. Hundred percent. And I'm like, of course, fascism is awful, and I hate it, obviously. But like, the design of the Imperial Stormtrooper modernized, so fucking cool. Yeah, it is. Visually, I think this episode did a pretty it, good job. I'm with you. Yeah, it's I'm visually fantastic. Yeah, I want to go back to the scenes with Leah, Le- Le- <laughs> Leah, Princess Leia Leah. and Riva, not Leah and Reva, not Leah and Reva, Leah and Reva. Um, Princess Leah, loyal like termination. <laughs> like you, like I, I said, I think something I just thought of is this kind of helps explain. It didn't need explaining because. Leia is Leia. We know who that character is. Know There's who, one character who we know doesn't who need to Fisher is herself. And... It's Leia motherfucking Organa. Yeah, 100%. I think we know who Leia is. We know how much awesomeness and just uh, chutzpah and just badassery that, uh, that uh, Carrie Fisher imbued Leia with. Rest in peace, Rest in peace, man. Carrie. So this didn't need explaining, but this also does give more background as well to why Leia is so calm and composed when she's being held hostage by freaking Darth Vader and Tarkin. But do you go and do go in toe to toe with Darth Vader and dissing Tarkin to their faces on the Death Star? And now you're like, oh wow, when she was when she was what she ten? Yeah, she was nine. Was, when she was nine. When she was when she was nine. She. No, but Ben says she's 10, and Obi-Wan says she's 10 in this episode. She says Roken, she's 10 years old. No, she's Maybe 10. I, yeah, no, I was we, right. I mean, you were you right. She you. was 10. She was 10. Yeah. You get the gist. Yeah, when like, she was a 10-year-old. I thought that was cool. But she's more going importantly... Going toe-to-toe with an Inquisitor. Yeah. This is Reva. She says, Leia, the braver you seem, the more scared you really are. I learned that at a young age. And there's no one better to deliver that message than Reva. Because that is, she that yells, was one of the she blusters. That's one of the main points I was going to make later in this episode, and one of the things I wrote most about in my notes actually for this episode, which is that line: "The people you are trying to protect, they are not coming for you." I'm like, okay, Reva, who are you saying that to, Leia, or yourself? Yeah. The thing about Reva is that there's so much theater in who she is, in who she in who she portrays herself as, and who she's trying to be. When in reality, she's the least of the Inquisitors, as they repeatedly tell her to her face. She's desperate to avoid failing in the eyes of Darth Vader. She wants to gain Vader's approval. She is the same as Leia in that way. She's putting on a brave face, but she is She There's that line later when she's talking to Tala. I do like a good liar. Obviously. Because that's who you are right now. She is in a perpetual state of lying to herself and everyone around her. Like, yeah. she is. Like, Leia, I, like Reva, of course she's made some bad choices along the way. But at the end of the day, I think we can both agree that she's a reasonable human being. She's not a dark side. She's not a dark sider like somebody like the fifth brother or the night sister or second sister, even. Who, or let's take Drill out of this, actually. Like, the fifth brother or the ninth sister, or or even Granny. Granny is a good example. I don't know. She, she, she's pretty freaking... She's pretty freaking cruel and ruthless. But I agree that, like, she's doing what... She's leaning into doing what she needs to do to serve... And she... And, I, she, like, yeah. and, and Quizzy, if you talk to him about... If you're like, dude, you're torturing a child. Quizzy would probably be like, yeah, no, anything to get the job done. Reva, if you pushed her enough, I think she knows what she's doing is wrong. Yeah, maybe. And, and maybe. I think that, like, I, again, she's trying to do one of the, like, one of the things, like, she's trying to do the things that evil people do to, like, accurately, this is going to be a weird way of saying it, cosplay as an evil yeah. person. But, no, I think you're right. She might be LARPing to a little degree. <laughs> I think, you know, what we know about her... Clearly, she is a brutal person, but she has done some, she has done some brutal and unspeakable acts, yeah. very violent and cruel. 
and she was preparing to torture 10 year old Leia. That being said, like, I do think that there is something to your idea a hundred percent that maybe for her, what this really is about, given where she came from trauma and the situation that she was in at the temple at the time of the purge, this for her is about the only way that she sees the path that she's been forced into the only way for her to, the only way out is uh, further up or further down, descending further into the dark side by getting more respect, more power. That's the only way that she can have control over herself and her life and feel and safe. And I gen- genuinely be interested, of course, this the, she was cut off by Tala at the exact right moment, but I would have genuinely been interested to see if she would have actually tortured Leia. I, I think she, she was gearing She was it. gearing up to do it and like... She was absolutely, I don't think she was like trying to bluff to Leia or anything, but there is a, like a sense of, I do think that Reva sees a lot of herself in Leia, even not thinking about the force sensitivity part, which she doesn't know, obviously. I think she sees a lot of that feisty spirit in the younger version of herself. And yeah, they definitely lean into that trope of the villain who's captured the hero. We're not so different, you and I. You know, the villain sees that, yeah, we're not so different, you and I, or like the sympathy, yeah. villain having sympathy but, for the hero, all that kind of thing. But I'm not saying that she would not, period, have done it. But like, it's. I, I'm not sure if she would have yeah. done it. something there. We don't sure know what she would have done. That's it. true. But. That's true. We don't uh, know. But. Obi Wan discovers the morgue, which is a scene I never thought. Thought we were gonna get. My God, it, that that delivery from Ewan. It, yeah, too, A plus. That was it. Is some of his best acting in the series. Is you could feel like, like Ewan is back, not just Obi Wan's back. Ewan is back. Yeah, he spent a lot of time in this series being very scared, yeah. and he's very good at yeah. it. So, it and by the way, so I have a bone to pick with the Kenobi staff, the Kenobi writers team. It's not cool what you did, guys. It's not cool what you did, people. You know it's what not. you did. You brought Terra Sanube and the Kosian species into live action just to show me his fucking dead body? That's not cool. Not cool, man. Mm. Not cool. Yeah, rip, rip Terra Sanube. Like, 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 like you, did, you, did, you did that to poor, poor Joseph Scrimshaw. Poor Joseph Scrimshaw. Yeah. <laughs> One of his favorite glove shittos. Terra Sanube. And you brought him and you monkeys pawed him. That's what you did, Lucas. Tell me, you monkeys pawed him. You said, "Okay, we'll show you Terra Sanube as a corpse." I hope you feel good about yourself, Lucasfilm. I hope you feel good about what oh, you did, God. Joseph Scrimshaw. Yeah. Joseph Scrimshaw has never done anything yeah, to you guys. Stay... Yeah, stay strong, Force. Stay center. strong, Force. Stay strong. <laughs> so, speaking of the tomb, I mean, I, there's so much symbolism in this episode particularly and it's really cool i think obi-wan literally like we see him get drawn in deeper and deeper into the tomb he just keeps walking he can't look away he's presented with the irrefutable evidence of what he sees as his failure what he sees as the collective failure of the jedi the great tragedy that has befallen him and he's going deeper and deeper into it we see he's looking around he's just leaning into that completely falling into it and then it's leia who pulls him out he senses that she's about to be tortured how great is that look obi-wan at the beginning of this show literally drowning in the past literally being crushed under the weight not literally but being crushed under the weight of the tragedy that he has undergone his guilt his grief his sorrow and what gets him out of that, what puts him back on track, is it being present. The power of the present to say, I have to put this aside. I have to put this down. There are people who need my help. Yeah. And this scene symbolizes that and encapsulates that perfectly. It's like the entire show in one scene. It's a, it's ha- it's a haunting scene. And, I, and my joking aside, I'm glad they put it in there. The... I didn't catch Coleman Cage, but I know he's in there. That's a fucking council member in there. But it's the youngling that hits at home for me. Yeah, I and mean, he because now I'm imagining. You know what I'm imagining now? You know who that youngling probably knew? 
Reva. Ooh. That was yeah. that might have been one of her friends. <laughs> I'm imagining that might have been one that Anakin killed. Oh, I'm sure it was one that Anakin killed. But the point is, I don't know that for a fact, but maybe I don't know. But my point with that being. I want to see Reva going down there mm. to see like, she's she would tell everybody she's doing it to like look at the failure of the Jedi like all that kind of stuff she's playing the role but in some sense that kid's who she's doing it for yeah no, and it's Sorry, no. it's this there's that moment like there's that moment in part three where she's looking at the hidden path looking at the the destiny that she could have had and there's and i feel like that there's that moment with there is it's a similar moment it would be a similar moment with her going down there is that she is for revenge working with the people who killed that young child yeah she is working with genocidal fascists to avenge her friends. And another thing that this left me wondering was for what purpose are the Jedi suspended, like frozen in this crazy, like amber glass? For what reason are their eyes open? They're, you don't see any, they're frozen yeah. there in their last moments. However, it is their eyes are open. If only there was some like they're, Sith they're, Lord like, who was a dramatic bitch who did everything he did just for the most dramatic reasons yeah. ever. Who was in charge of the Inquisitorius? If only. Yeah. Obviously, Palpatine doesn't need a reason, but I am. Oh, like, I wasn't talking I about Palpatine. Curious, I was not talking about Palpatine. Like, oh, Vader. <laughs> <laughs> that is such yeah. a Vader move, I can't tell. This is the guy who, again, and I know we mentioned... Straight up drama queens, man. Yeah, he is such a drama queen. He is such... You know, he loves that drama, and he's okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the Jedi. You're going to suspend them in this amber, and we're going to have our Inquisitors, who are all former Jedi like me, they can walk down there and look at their fallen peers suspended in animation. How fucking gruesome will that be? Yeah, and there's no way... This is a little morbid, but there's no way they all, like, were so intact after they died. There's no way they weren't, like, like stitched together oh, or, yeah, like, there, some of them. They were, like, must have specifically set tactics. up yeah. so that you can't see any wounds. You can't see any, like, s sign, physical yeah. sign of... And it's... It I would just keep wondering, God, for what it's, purpose? Like, obviously, the Empire doesn't need a purpose. The Empire doesn't need... Oh, yeah, and you, and you gotta remember, most people, won't, most people won't see this, but, again, this is the Inquisitor's headquarters. I think this is to... I think this is almost as a, like, a... This is a... This is a sign to the Inquisitors. Hey, remember what we did to your friends? <laughs> if, yeah. if you ever think about leaving us just remember what we did to all of your friends and peers and colleagues yeah it's horrible it's horrifying and it's fantastic the fact that that freaking of all places that tell it chooses the sertar sector and florum i just know that deborah called dave or somebody called Dave when they were filming that, and they're like, and Dave's like, you're using Hondo's planet in Obi Wan Kenobi. Fuck yeah, my man, let's go. I just know that Dave Not was that, so hyped about it. The planet where Obi Wan and Anakin hung out with Dooku for a whole episode, <laughs> where they were tied together at the waist. Wait. So Hilarious. many things happened on that planet. Ahsoka fought General Grievous on that planet, if you remember. Yeah. The circus happened on that Shit planet. went down on Florum, man. Aura Singh died on Florum, or it was she, did she actually died. die there? Or was that a fake? Yeah, she, she faked, faked her died death. On, like, Adi Galia died. Everything, everything happened on Florum, man. Adi Galia died. On Adi, Adi Galia was slammed. By the way, so all we want sneaks into the cell. 
Jacob, do you remember what, what the conversation Obi-Wan had with Leia last episode? What does the Force feel like? Yeah. Have you ever been afraid of the dark? What does Obi-Wan do the minute he gets into that cell? He turns off the lights and turns on his lightsaber. How does it feel when you turn on the light? That was the first time I noticed that on this watching was the first time I realized that this was a visual metaphor, but God. See, yeah. He's turning on, he's turning on the light is beautiful. He, yeah. So and beautiful. The, but like him cutting down those stormtroopers again, him deflecting the blaster bolts. It's, I, I will quote Captain Phasma. So good to have you back. Like, yeah. Yeah. He, it's awesome. It's fantastic. And again, another thing about Obi-Wan in this episode, the way he uses his lightsaber changes. Before this, he ignites it against Vader. He's, it's a terrified last resort. Oh, yeah. But here, he's using his lightsaber with purpose to save life. Yeah. That's another thing that changes, which I thought was cool. Do you want to get to the, the escape? Yeah, let's get to the escape. Let's get to this window scene, which I thought was really good. That, uh, yeah. like, Obi-Wan holding the... Hold, holding the window in from collapsing and then releasing it against the stormtroopers, that is a quintessential Jedi moment for me. Like, that that just defines Darth Vader. And not Darth Vader, goddammit. That defines Obi-Wan Kenobi for me. Like, that is such a that is such an intense moment. Of course, Tala and Leia meet... No, Tala meets back up with Leia and Obi-Wan as they go out. Yeah, no, it, it, seeing Obi-Wan regain the Force this episode was a joy. Because, again, it's... People often minimize the force to a power that you have. That's not what it is. It's an energy field that you can tap into. And you have to be connected to it to use it to your favor. Yeah. You have to follow its will to a certain extent. And you have to be connected to it. And be connected be connected to yourself in a certain way to use it. And that's what Obi-Wan's struggle in the last few episodes was is how do I reconnect with the Force? And he's still got it. He has still got it. All right, I want to talk about discourse for a little bit that you've been fortunate enough to avoid, but... but Living under, the, living under a rock is a beautiful it, thing. It is. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, so people really hated <clears throat> the whole Leia hiding under the trench coat thing. <laughs> they really hate it. So that's what this is about. Yeah, they did. They thought it was too goofy. The they thought it was too goofy. They thought that obviously that it's ridiculous that nobody would have noticed. And that it was like the silliest plan ever to get Leia out of there. First of all, I don't know if you saw how many other fucking things were going on at the Fortune Inquisitorius at that time. Nobody was fucking noticing. Even at its slowest times, Fortress Inquisitorius is a fucking factory because of how much needs to get done there. Literally nobody was paying attention. There were hundreds of people and literally no one was paying attention to that one Imperial officer who whose legs looked a little bit bulkier than the other ones. Literally nobody noticed or cared. I thought it looked pretty obvious, but... Hey, I've got bigger fish yeah. to fry. Yeah, it's... Look, if you want to spend your time, you know, figuring out the intricacies of the visual stealth properties of hiding a small child under a giant trench coat, yeah, more power to you. I don't know. I, was it, like, in my opinion, was it goofy? Yeah. But, like, they, they just went in there, like, knowing that they had to do whatever it took to save Leia. And if it comes, if it comes down to it, like taking the act like taking stupid action or very risky action is better than taking no action at all in this Absolutely. situation so was it kind of weird yeah but ultimately yeah they could have pushed her out in a crate or something like they could have made that be the way that they brought her out but ultimately it's they wanted to show that it was very desperate yeah and i think they did do that yeah it's whatever like yeah no it's like it, may, may, maybe we care just a little too much about the wrong things sometimes it's a possible very true extremely <laughs> very true i feel like you say very possible yes in this situation i'm i this course on over that moment alone and that being the reason why everyone sucked was mind-numbingly stupid 
and that's all the time I'm willing to spend on that. You gotta let go of what people say on the internet. It doesn't help. Trust me, I don't think about it often. Literally, the only reason I was thinking about it, be- it was because I saw the moment and then reminded me, oh yeah, I remember when people Fair enough. were shitting over that for no reason. All right, but the path coming in clutch here, this is another one of those moments. We saw this in Solo, and now we're seeing it here. This is one of the founding moments of the Rebellion. Whether they realize it or not, that's what it is. It yeah. is like, It is one of the first, like, acts of resistance against the Empire. And it's, and we have our first loss here. Wade doesn't make it out. That's the reality in war. Sometimes people don't make it out. Yeah. 100%. And, and I don't think Roken or anybody else really... Other than Obi Wan, because of course he's been in war. We're really ready for that yet, and I'm not blaming them. They didn't think they were going to have to be in this situation anytime soon. But that's what this is. This is what happens, and this is the environment that we're going to see over the next nine years. It's this is evidence, not galactic evidence, but small evidence that yeah. The Empire can bleed. Yeah. 100%. Um, and this is the cause. And we horrible. won't get... We won't get, we won't get... We won't get... A true... Like... Burst of resistance. Like a true... Like actual hit against the Empire. I'd say until Aldani. In Andor. But this is setting the stage for things like Aldani. And did. I love how they shoot the action here. Again, nose the volume a little bit. Don't care. The action just so good. The the cut to Vader, like the like Riva and I believe it's fifth brother watching the that like that air spear fly away to the instant cut of Vader storming in. You were warned what defeat could bring is such a good cut. It's yeah. such a good ending moment. It is so jarring. But he's immediately like, oh shit, this guy is pissed. Yeah. Like, you, like, again, like, most of this episode was about escaping the Inquisitors. And much, like, this is an episode I feel like is a bit of a microcosm of, of the last three where you get the Inquisitors for the first two, but then when Vader comes in and you're like, oh no, they're not playing around now. Vader is wants Obi-Wan dead. Or really, I don't think he wants him dead. I think he wants to capture and torture him, really. But like, Vader is so pissed at Obi-Wan, and this guy has a power that's greater than all the Inquisitors combined. Yeah, and it's that moment. Even it's impressive. It's more even more impressive to me now, honestly, because we know that voice is a little bit AI generated. How good that dialogue sounds! Like that, the delivery of "You were warned what defeat could bring" yeah. was terrifying. This is like furious is Vader. Terrifying. It's fantastic. You got anything else before we wrap this episode? No, I guess it, I'll do me. the. I overall. Thoughts? I know. I, I there's going to be one more thing I mentioned before we end this, which is right, of course we have the tracker being in the droid. There was a meme that went around with a it was like a Simpsons edit, where it was Leia. It was young Leia going around. It was around episode. It was around part five's release. I was like, I think he set this thing to evil. <laughs> Accidentally, whoops. I uh, like the tracker being in Lola of all things and her glowing red because the Imperial trackers in it is so campy and I love it. Yeah. Evil Lola. E- evil Lola is it, it's so goofy and I love it. Your overall thoughts on this episode, Jake? Overall, I like this episode a lot. It did a great job of showing Obi-Wan taking that big leap or having so many pivotal moments. I thought that Riva and Leia, their dynamic in this episode was tremendous. I really liked what Tala brought to the episode as well. I thought that there were some parts that felt a little contrived, I think, towards the end. I think this episode started really strong, and then 
after the tomb scene, after he helps Leia escape, after the water scene, once they're out in the main hangar, I feel like it it falls apart just a little bit. Something about the just the pacing and the execution of the rest of the episode. It's not quite it's not quite there. It didn't quite it didn't I, I didn't feel like impacted by it. I it didn't feel like it hit quite as hard as I think they were trying to make it. So I think over overall, I enjoyed this episode and it brought a lot to the table. It wasn't perfect by any means, but I think especially for this show, it was a bang up job. It was very good. So I left feeling pretty, pretty positive after my rewatch of it. Full disclosure, this episode is my least favorite of this show. That being said, it's fantastic. It's not really my least favorite episode of the show. It's my sixth favorite episode of the show. It just mm. happens to be out of six. Like, it's not that this is bad. It's not. It's just that the other five are better. And what's better than brilliant? Perfection. And that's what, and I categorize one, two, and four as brilliant. Episodes one, two, and four as brilliant. And three, five, and six as perfection. It There's just so much, for me, this, this series is so personal for me because I just love it so much and it's something that I really want to see and I know that a lot of people like a lot of dude bros want to see this and I'm so glad that they made it in a way that was not like they could have done a, such a dude bro version of this and they didn't they did a personal emotional version that's still connected to the saga and brought in animation concept and all that kind of stuff there's um but no this episode is this episode is great the holding in the flood, Reva and Vader's confrontation at the end, all of Viz- Vivian and Moses' screen time together, meeting Roken. So much damn good stuff in this episode. Absolutely. Yeah, all right. I, I think that's going to be it for this week. Next week on Star Wars Neoxy, we are excited to announce that Boop and John from the Nerd Herder podcast, good friends of the show, Boop, my co host on Star Wars and a Galaxy Epic Confrontations, and a good friend of mine. They are, the two of them are going to be on to cover part five with us. And then the week after that will be part six with a good friend of the show, one of my personal friends and mentors in the Star Wars creator space, Mr. Alden Diaz from Octo Radio. And that, that will be a wrap on season 16 of Star Wars in a Galaxy. We look forward to that. But we also look forward to Jacob. What's that? The return of the bracket streams, baby. The return of the bracket streams. Yes. On Sunday, February 11th. No, I did not know this was the Super Bowl when I was planning it. And no, I don't care. I don't think nerds watch the Super Bowl anyway. Sorry if that's a stereotype. Anyway, on on Sunday, February 11th, myself, Jacob, Alden Diaz from Octo Radio, Tori Fox from Boba Fest and all of her other stuff, and Laura Kelly from Forced Toast are all going to be talking Jedi. We're going to do a Jedi bracket stream. 32 Jedi enter. One leaves as the favorite of the bracket stream. We're so excited to get back to bracket streams. We're doing factions of characters. So Jedi, Sith is next. I think we're going to bounty it after that. And then we're doing one called Best of the Rest, basically, which is the, all the non-Jedi Sith bounty under characters that we want to talk about. And so go watch that. It'll be on February 11th on the Star Wars in a Galaxy YouTube channel tune into epic confrontations we just did our double header for the month of january which released about a week ago with our number one contender match and with our match modeled after the inner geekdom division of the schmodown you can find this show at in the galaxy pod everywhere you can listen to us on spotify apple podcast google podcast wherever you listen to podcasts will be there you can follow me by going to my link tree l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash underscore o2fan 327 is where you can find all my stuff and I'm excited to be back, Jacob, and I'm really excited to get go back going on Obi-Wan Kenobi and more Star Wars and Galaxy stuff. But I guess until next time, I'll just say may the Force be with you. Always. Always. <laughs>